Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Leadership and Workforce Summit. Um, thank you for joining. This is the third of our summit series. So I'd like you to first thank our gold sponsors, which are Brown and Caldwell, Corolo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy and Jenks. And our silver sponsor is Stantec. I'd also like to thank the conference committee for putting the summit series together. So a CEU poll will pop up during each session and that will ensure that um, it, the only thing you have to do is to ensure that you answer each question so we can track your participation. So please tweet your comments during the event to at PNCWA org and they will show up in the Twitter feed in the platform. So, and we'll also have about a four to five minute uh, break between each of the sessions to give you time to move from one into the other. And if you have any issues um, getting it from one to the other, a simple refresh is usually the trick. So please also join us after the last session for the Q&A with the speakers. Um, we set up Zoom rooms with the speakers and you can find all of that information by selecting the networking sessions in the agenda. So um, one of the things too that I'm going to do is I'm not going to read everyone's bios before each introduction because we have got a packed agenda and we want to keep things moving. So um, you can find those obviously in each session if you want to read a little bit more about each speaker. So with that, I'd like to start. So Sarah Heineke is the Executive Director of Lloyd Eco District. And today she is going to talk to us about how small wins lead to big solutions, leveraging partnerships to build sustainable communities. Sarah, take it away. And I'll see you back here at nine o'clock for questions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the PNCWA Summit Series. Um, as Karen mentioned, my name is Sarah Heineke. I'm the Executive Director of Lloyd Eco District. And I am going to talk to you about how I helped tap into our community's resilience. And through the process of building trust through small wins, we use that resilience to expand our vision of a sustainable community centered on social equity. So it's early and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you how it all worked out up front and then kind of fill in the details. So here it goes. When I got started as the ED of Lloyd Eco District, I, I had to prove to the community that this was an idea that could work. The Eco District idea was frankly eagerly endorsed by the business leadership in Lloyd, but they really wanted to make sure that this was an idea that the community had agency over and that was that it was not something that was being primarily driven by regulation. So I had to start with small projects. It was a crawl, walk, run, run approach designed to gain buy-in and demonstrate our competence and our capacity to take on larger projects eventually. And so we did that. Over about seven years of crawling and walking with small projects, we were pretty much ready to run. And what we ended up using that social capital for when tested wasn't in fact a big district scale green infrastructure project or some other big green project, but rather a coming together around solving a piece of the houseless crisis in Lloyd. And that response to the houseless community has further strengthened our, our community identity and our ability to respond in crisis and to take on ever more challenging sustainability projects, which more closely align with our original mission. Experiencing the power of this community resilience has changed the vision of my organization and the way the community thinks about itself and what it's capable of doing in crisis and opportunity forever. I think there is a lesson there for agencies and utilities to think about resilience, equity, and sustainability in an expanded way. And I know many of you are talking about how to incorporate equity into your projects and frameworks and perhaps struggling with that. Um, what I can tell you is that when Lloyd put equity at the center of our policy and practice of sustainability, the policies and the practice really started to make more sense and they really started to work better. So let me get into the details and then we can open it up for questions. Next slide. The idea of eco districts is simple in concept and difficult in practice. 
Eco districts are designed to accelerate the pace of change in the realm of climate action by activating that change at the neighborhood scale. But why neighborhoods? Neighborhoods are big enough to be impactful, but not so large that they are bogged down by the bureaucracy of cities. And they're also not just a single sort of vanity project, green building exercise. So it's sort of this sweet spot of scale. Next slide. So we set out to form an idea around the principles of green building, smart infrastructure, and behavior and choice. Next slide. This idea was created by PDC in the mayor's office in 2008 as a way of creating a living laboratory for projects and initiatives which could advance our climate action plan and export world-class green building and planning acumen. Eco districts could be a place where we took our green building and planning expertise to the next level, where firms in Portland could showcase that work and jumpstart job growth in a post-recession Portland. So originally there were five designated neighborhoods, all located in urban renewal areas. So in Gateway, Lentz, Lloyd, Portland State, um, and South Waterfront. And now there is only the Lloyd Eco District. Um, and I won't get into why that is, but suffice it to say, it was a very difficult proposition to actually pull off. Uh, next slide. So that sounds intriguing, but what does this really mean? What is this eco district thing? Um, and by the way, that's a naked mole rat. So how does eco district really get to these na neighborhood scale projects? It isn't as if we, we draw a boundary and then magically things scale up. Um, for Lloyd, the idea of eco districts is a specific kind of radical co-mingling of capital, meaning we find a way of for entities to co-invest in big capital projects. Secondly, we want eco districts to think about um, the work that we do as economic development and wealth creation. So it's economic development for businesses and it's wealth creation for individuals. It's a kind of rising tide lifts all both boats ethos. And finally, in the beginning, and this is all sort of the beginning sort of framework, uh, the scale issue is key. So again, it's not enough that we have a single high performer in Doubletree uh, or a single high performer um, with the Moda Center working alone as high performers. We have to figure out how to do all of that sort of stuff together in a significant way. So if we're talking about a campus or a single ownership group or Canada, then district scale projects are relatively easy to imagine. Think district energy or water projects across multiple buildings. But as you may know, Lloyd District is not a campus, nor is it in Canada. So in order for us to, to get individual property owners in out of town real estate investment trusts and corporate headquarters to operate as collectives requires a tremendous amount of skill in developing and maintaining partnerships that would demonstrate a reason to collaborate outside of the typical capitalist business structure. These are, that's not, that's not a dig, that's a fiduciary responsibility and it's an intense roadblock to operating as a collective. So I had to demonstrate what the value proposition would be for leaders to come along for this neighborhood scale idea. Next slide, please. So we started the basic with the basic current conditions. And we we use this, use the existing urban renewal boundary for inspiration. Um, and we looked to the much admired Lloyd Crossing plan from Methune, which imagined a future Lloyd being a kind of green building urban oasis and created a roadmap of our four basic performance areas. So these would be areas to focus on future projects, but would also really rely on current areas where Lloyd was already doing great work. So essentially kind of really doubled down on the urban planning side of things, you know, really sort of said, okay, what, what are we doing and, and where do we wanna go? Next slide. So in Lloyd, the work had already started. There was a long history of collaboration um, and there was a good reason for that long history of collaboration because about 80% of the property in Lloyd was owned by eight individual entities. So it was relatively easy 
to get Lloyd interest around the table, literally around a table. So um, OCC or your convention center, Doubletree, the Blazers, Metro headquarters, others were already leaders in the areas of energy efficiency and waste reduction. And Lloyd had a transportation management association. So Lloyd was very ahead of the game in terms of the building blocks of creating a sustainable community. It just sort of needed something that knit it all together. Next slide, please. So Lloyd leaders really bought into this idea and they bought into it because they felt like sustainability writ large would really start to define development in the future. Now this is about 2011. And, and what they saw was an opportunity to differentiate the Lloyd submarket in terms of commercial development and real estate growth. So they felt that sustainability would really be a big driver. They wanted to get ahead of that curve. Next slide. So in 2012, we created a roadmap, a baseline and a 2035 projection for water waste transportation and energy efficiency. But ultimately, you know, it's just me and this, this sort of proto board. And so we had to prioritize and waste reduction and energy efficiency were areas that I prioritized because I knew that we could get organized through some public sector and energy trusted work and partnerships. Next slide. So in the first few years of Lloyd Eco District, we set up the roadmap, we, est we established that all the community, uh, sorry, commercial properties would measure their energy usage we tracked it through a master account well before the city required it. And this led to a deeper dive in the energy actions outlined in the roadmap. So next slide, we, we put together a very ambitious energy action plan, which looked at the roadmap baseline and reduction goals for the first five years, and then established, next slide, four areas where we could influence that projected reduction. Um, in, 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 the, in the realms of existing buildings, in the realms of new buildings, in the rel realm of renewables and district energy. Um, and, you know, these aren't potentially small projects. These are really, really big projects. So, um, you know, we had to find a way to sort of find our place within that realm to drive influence. Uh, next slide, please. So from that energy action plan, we developed these ambitious calculations of where we were going to be um, for the next five years. So we essentially took the 2035 ultimate goal for the eco district, the sort of big uh, roadmap goal, and, and chunked it out in five-year increments and said, uh, if if we have a 25% reduction goal overall using simple math, let's divide that reduction area by five and divide it among the categories. And, and here are our simple sort of back of the envelope targets for the next five years. Next slide. So as the implementation evolved, um, and now we're thinking about goals sort of in and more implementation kind of language. So we're thinking about in terms of buildings and um, building ownership, third party infrastructure actors, uh, eco district management and what that sort of category of work would look like. And if you can click through this slide, it'll show the, the project areas where we actually did that work. And these are the highlights of, of the work that actually ended up happening. So these were the small projects that we were organizing our community to do and pushing and pulling them toward these five-year goals. By the third year, we had set up a regular stakeholder monthly meeting where facility managers, operation managers, property managers got together to share best practices and uh, learn from each other, enroll in discounted classes to become energy managers, they were starting to tell their bosses the good news about the energy re reductions they were now tracking. These stakeholders became champions for themselves and for our work. And so Lloyd Eco District starts reporting out participation rates in the Energy Star Portfolio Manager Master Account, 
we're launching triple bottom line um, LED retrofit programs that sort of a group purchasing sort of light um, kind of program where we provide the warm leads of stakeholder groups to a lighting contracting company that would offer LED retrofits and agree to share between one and 3% of the profits from those completed jobs. So uh, we're creating a kind of revenue stream, but we're also creating a triple bottom line project because ultimately when those profits come to us, uh, we're sharing a portion of them with Central City Concern also uh, as an affordable housing provider, thus providing a kind of equity or people, people leg of the three-legged stool, which is people, planet, profit. So everything was really starting to sort of gel and come together. And except for these projects, um, you know, energy efficiency and waste reduction and planning and uh, strategic energy management, those are all great. They're super important in terms of foundational work, but they're virtually invisible. And anyone walking down the streets of Lloyd District in uh, 2012 certainly couldn't tell that anything was radically different. We couldn't maintain stakeholder support for eco district work if it didn't look like anything was really happening. And so the property owners who were really behind the leadership in Lloyd, um, you know, were gently nudging us in the direction of, of, of really externalizing our, our program base. So we turned our focus to also include a more people centric place making set of program ob objectives. Slide 16. Next slide. So from this point, we began to expand into other realms of performance and start to externalize the Lloyd Eco District work. Um, we worked on um, a pollinator bikeway, the uh, nat natural organic recycling machine was developed, um, a 2.3 megawatt solar array was installed. Let me get here. Uh, our waste reduction action plan was developed sort of along the same lines as the energy action plan. That's wrap. So um, next slide. And we started tracking and developing programs that really added up in terms of not just commercial property interest, but really the wider community. And though the, the original idea of eco districts came from the development commission, there, there really wasn't any big urban renewal public sector partnership, nor, nor big budgets, which my organization would be able to raise or leverage for district scale projects. And a lot of that came out of politics essentially. So the, the original mayor who developed the idea with, with PDC now Prosper Portland uh, was no longer the mayor. And, um, and so the political support for this idea evaporated. And so we really had to find um, our own way about this sort of implementation route. We really had to find uh, essentially not really a public sector partnership driving this agenda, but really a, a business sector, uh, a private sector agenda driving a kind of collaborative uh, movement forward. And so we had to, had to really build that collaboration identity through project pilots and bringing together any kind of willing business partners we could find. So we created community engagement with, next slide, foster kids and muralists, for example. Um, next slide, we started giving district tours, starring our lead platinum multifamily community with a, a black water, gray water system, otherwise known as Haslow on eight. Next slide. We worked with e-bike companies to create several e-bike challenges, which were a blast and super fun and very visible and very engaging. Next slide. We were working with landscape architects to who were willing to partner with us on pollinator placemaking projects. Uh, next slide. And uh, you know we had to drive really hard bargains with goats to donate their landscaping abilities. Next slide. We developed a really cool partnership with Portland Pedal Power, who unfortunately 
have been, um, uh, I think they, they got merged with a different sort of Grubhub kind of uh, entity, so they are no longer. Uh, but we, when they were around, we created a, a, a bike powered catering and food reclamation pilot where uh, business catered lunches were catered with virtually no waste, zero waste. Um, and any of the food that remained, we set up all kinds of food safety criteria for that food to get donated if there were leftovers to the Portland Res Rescue Mission. Next slide. Uh, we created a pollinator corridor on our protected bikeway along Northeast Multnomah involving uh, residents and kids and businesses. And next slide. Uh, we got businesses and residents to just basically, you know, pitch in anytime we had a, a project in the district that uh, we could find a way for people to get engaged with our message. So this incrementalism was intentional and necessary and we had to collaborate to come up with partnership proposals because we had very little project funding. The flip side of that from a community development point of view was that even with project funding, we probably would have still done a lot of that um, because the collaboration benefits, the community building benefits were so critical to the success of building this sense of community. So, so it's, you know, uh, both sides of that coin were in operation at, at sort of full force. Um, however, if we were ever gonna get to those big impactful district scale projects, that behavior change, super important, we had to do it. We had to create those partnerships in that community, but we also kind of needed to just take that next step. And so next slide, as we were heading into our seventh year, we were really ready to take our work to the next level and maybe a larger community solar project or uh, one of the uh, waste reduction action plan projects, an ambitious ne ne district negotiated waste hauling contract the first of its kind in a commercial district in Portland. But instead in 2017, the houseless rest area known as Right to Dream 2 was relocated to the Lloyd by the mayor's office through a series of property transfer deals that didn't go well and neighborhood complaints that also did not go well. Next slide. So the Lloyd community was not consulted and the business community of Lloyd was ready to launch a Luba complaint against the city. Next slide. One small business owner addressing our annual fundraiser at that time urged the community to consider a more open-hearted approach. And taking that lead, I urged community leaders to go slow and to reconsider, reconsider the Luba complaint. I was able to ask the question, who are we? And, you know, and, and have good answers. And, and the answers were, you know, we are a community that works together to benchmark our energy to reuse black water and gray water in a commercial multifamily development. We create age-friendly business designations so that our elders are, feel safe in, in the stores in our area. We create pollinator corridors. We get employees out of their office and onto e-bikes. Um, we design murals with foster kids. So surely if there is a way for a Portland neighborhood to figure out how to come to terms with a houseless rest area within its midst, it must be us. And given the seven years of incremental gains, cooler heads prevailed and that's what we did. Next slide. We established a good neighbor agreement. We led a campaign to fundraise and build tiny homes for the members in the rest area. Next slide. We built solar powered batteries for the members to stay charged up. And next slide. And so that they could stay connected to their communities and next three slides. Um, engage the rebuilding center, and turn a construction, uh, plus about 150 volunteers over five weekends to build tiny homes and, and what, what's known as juice boxes. With, there's a juice box getting installed um, and the juice box is the solar powered battery. So for the, the next, or sorry, the, the past three years, we've been involved with on a monthly basis, continuing to work with Right to Dream 2 or R2D2 as it's known um, to find a permanent home or a more stable source of funding. And this year in the beginning of the pandemic, and they, they struggled with this. So it was every year, you know, sort of how do we pay the bills to get the porta potty 
um, dealt with and, you know, our, our tiny electric bill and all these things were um, very challenging because this rest area is run by homeless folks. So this year we, um, we stepped up and we took the lead to compel our community to raise their entire, their entire budget in three weeks through donations as small as $25. And we did that because we didn't know how the pandemic was gonna impact um, Right to Dream too. And we, this community feels very um, connected and, and strongly that we wanna help the folks who are being served there. So all this remarkable work was, de was definitely noticed by City Hall and the Joint Office. And that, that pitching in and that finding of their entire budget within three weeks ultimately led to a rethinking of Right to Dream 2's shelter classification, which means now they're eligible for regular shelter funding and we don't need to, and they don't need to spend all the resources finding funding. This is exactly the kind of value an organization like Lloyd Eco District should provide the community, leveraging its influence to help find long-term sustainable solutions. But um, more than that, it demonstrated a next level kind of community resilience. In this next level, the community now thinks of itself as the kind of community that can come together for whatever reason, and that will be good for times of crisis and great for times of opportunity. Now, I didn't think I was creating a community in order to be able to respond to the homeless crisis gripping Portland, but that's what we did. And we will not always be in crisis and we can someday soon prioritize the big district scale projects. And when we do, we know that those projects will be better than they would be without this equity focused resilience test. Next slide. So, the holy, holy grail of resilience, right? We found a way to add people to the three-legged stool. We're doing it right, yay us. Well, not so fast. Um, this, is where, this is where centering equity really comes into play. Now, um, I suspect that before this pivot, this pivot to really thinking about how, um, how do we add people and what does that really, if we really look at that, what does that look like? I think before that pivot, we might've continued as many, many do to understand triple bottom line projects if we're, if we're even thinking about triple bottom line projects as essentially more of a trickle bottom line project. That is um, letting the financial benefit and the climate benefits of green buildings or whatever ambitious green sustainable projects we might be considering really carry the weight for the people bottom line um, through trickle down economics. In other words, if we build good projects, there will be jobs. Yay, that's people. Okay, done, job, job over. Like it's triple bottom line, there's jobs. Or if we build a good project and it's a green building, then we have happy people. So it's a triple bottom line project. Well, and that's a, that's a classic sort of rising tide raises all boats theory of change, except that not everybody has a boat. And some of us are standing on the shore getting flooded or drowning. And it isn't simply enough to hope that your well-intentioned sustainability project eventually creates a better world. People are demanding to be dealt with directly. And we're seeing that dynamic playing out through this pandemic shutdown and within the racial and social reckoning. So, you know, um, look, we were, counting on triple bottom line like everyone else before working with R2D2. But when we were faced with dealing with a vulnerable population directly and finding a real neighborhood scale response, we took it on. And I have to say, I was not certain we could make it happen. It has been a difficult road to continue to find support and to communicate as a good partner. But three years later, we have an additional kind of resilience to rely upon and that brings benefits to all aspects of work we do. We know that our community is as strong as our most vulnerable members and also that those vulnerable members in many ways know more about resilience than we do. Next slide. So I'll leave you with thinking about this. 
when you build resilience in projects in literal terms, um, like dams and, and water plans and other things, think about how to involve your community and your stakeholders directly. How might capital asset resilience be enlarged to include more than just the physical project? And how might doing that include not only asset resilience, but also the overall resilience of the community in which the project resides? And how will that benefit everything? So that's, that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. And I think we have some time for a few questions. We do. And Sarah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So I'm going to ask this question first, even though it wasn't the first one in, just because I think with the time we have, it's an important one. Um, what about any political pushback? <laughs> there was none. No, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. um, well, can that be a little bit more specific? I think it was just wondering if there was any political pushback. Um, in terms of right to dream too, or? Sure, if you wanna start with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think there was pushback in terms of, you know, local like property owner politics. I think the, the politicians of Portland, um, you know, once they realized City Hall and our City Hall contacts through the Good Neighbor Agreement process, I mean, they were ecstatic that they had a community that was coming to the table and really seeking to find solutions. Um, so the, the sort of official politics of that were like, whatever you guys need, let's do it, let's figure it out. And the community actually held the, the feet of the city hall and county folks to the fire in terms of really, you know, we were standing up for right to dream too, eventually. Um, it, it was sort of a, you know, it, it started as a kind of look-see kind of situation with property owners at first, but I think once we got to know people and sort of realized what they were up against, um, it really was more like right to dream too and Lloyd together are going to advocate what what needs to happen for Right to Dream 2 to have a, a, a shot at um, providing the service they're providing and ultimately finding a, a longer term solution. Great. And then here's probably have time for one more. So what tactics did you find most successful in building partnerships with a very group or any organizations or persons? What was the first part? I think just any kind of building, any kind of partnerships or anything like that. I mean, did you, was there one outreach tactic that worked better than another? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think um, my, my sort of secret sauce on community outreach with partnerships is, um, you know, envisioning the, so I'll, I'll take, the Gen Z partnership, the e-bike partnership. So um, Gen Z was, you know, coming onto the Portland stage in, in the e-bike market. And uh, they had a, a marketing guy and he was sort of, you know, bringing an e-bike around and letting people try it out for a week. And it was a great idea because once you sort of got on an e-bike, even if you were a bike a cyclist and you were a snob or you hadn't ridden a bike in a long time, you were a convert. And so I, I think my, my sort of approach with him and, and his idea was just to sort of see if he could, you know, increase market share. Um, and my approach was, okay, his need is this. My need is to find ways to, um, you know, get people out of cars, get people more active, get people to really engage with active transportation and really see a new solution to a problem that they're sort of just uh, entrenched with in terms of I'm going to drive my car to work because I've got to run some errands at lunch uh, or whatever it might be. And so really putting myself in the partner's shoes to figure out if I can develop an idea around what I think their need is and really spend some time to understand what, what 
a new e-bike business's need might be trying to penetrate the Portland bike market, then that partnership is going to be pretty, pretty solid, I think. Um, and so I just directly approached it in that way, you know, like, oh, hey, what do you, this is what we need. It seems like you're trying to break into this area. How can we uh, leverage our, our, you know, stakeholder group? How can we bring something of value to the table for you? Great. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have, Sarah. That was wonderful. I appreciate that. And Sarah, you'll be available in the Zoom meetings or the individual rooms after, correct? That's right. Great. We will yeah. see you there. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. So now I'd like to introduce Lara Kamarek, who is going to lead us into a fun little icebreaker. Lara. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I was kind of disappointed when the annual conference was canceled in Spokane because one of my favorite parts is seeing all of you and visiting and you know just sharing um, everything that's been happening in our world in the last year. So what we thought we would do as part of this leadership summit today is just have some fun and get to know all of us that are on, on the call today. I'm sure that many of you have been inside feed loop, checking out all the contestants, or not contestants, but checking out all the um, attendees, seeing who's there. But now we're gonna have a way where everyone's gonna help chat and participate in this. So let's get started with a fun little game. So I am gonna show an image on the screen and you guys are gonna say, oh my gosh, what movie could this be? So, and then you jump out, go over to the chat on the right side and type what movie you think this is. And we, it'll be fun. I've, we put together lots of different types of movies, different genres, different eras, and hopefully we'll see all 64 of you participating and sharing with what you think um, the answer is. So hopefully you're typing in the chat and you're guessing what this movie could be. Okay, um, now let's transition and I'll share with you, it is, E.T., yep. And many of you know that um, E.T. is this great uh, movie about sci-fi and the world itself. But let's talk about movies that were filmed right here in the Pacific Northwest. So the next one that we'll do is, okay, let's see some of you guessing. Be fun to see different types of people sharing what they think this movie could be. I'll give you guys a hint. It was filmed in Southern Washington and in Portland, right here in our own backyard in PNCWA. It's, the answer is, yep, some of you've got it right, Twilight. Okay, now this next, this next movie might stretch our imaginations. Some of you might have to reach back in and think about when you were kids. Some of you might be thinking about watching this movie, sitting on the couch with your grandma. It's a pretty classic musical. And the answer is? Yep, you guessed it, Mary Poppins. Okay, so now you guys are trying to get the feel. Hopefully you'll be able to see people adding um, to the, the You'll see different friends of yours. You'll be wondering um, different types of people's love for different movies. But the next one is one that has many sequels, but it's just, just something fun for us. Yep, you guys are starting to get it. This is a great movie, it has four sequels and it's Ghostbusters, awesome. Okay. Some of you may be thinking to yourself, what in the world is this? But this is a movie that has two favorite of our stars from across the pond, if I can give you any hints. And hopefully you're seeing lots of fun ideas coming through. And you're right, four weddings and a funeral. Okay, you guys are starting to get the feel of it now. Okay, 
Now, I didn't come up with all these little movies. I must admit, I borrowed these um, from another fun networking event that we did as an icebreaker. So this is a movie I personally have not seen before, but in sharing this with my kids, yep, it is Edward Scissorhand. They shared with me that in this movie, did you know that Edward only says 169 words in the entire movie? So I guess that's a little fun movie fact for you. Okay, uh, let's do the next one. Okay, this is a fun movie. It really takes us back to um, in our time in history here in the United States. But the cool part about this movie is that it was only actually filmed over five months. Yep, you guys have guessed it. It is Dances with Wolves. And it was filmed on site in South Dakota, which I think is quite fun. We did not even go, okay, yep, next one. Um, this particular movie was, was actually um, inspired by a book. That book was by, by, by Lauren Weisberger. And you're right, Devil Wears Prada. You guys got this, I love it. Okay, next one might be a little bit harder. Are you ready? Okay, this movie was filmed in 1986 and it did not premiere in Hollywood like most movies. It, per, it, it premiered in, are you ready? New York City. And the answer is The Color of Money, awesome. Okay, I hope you guys are having fun with this little game. We just have a few more left. Hopefully you'll see some of your friends and different people in the chat. Okay, this one is probably pretty easy. This is about one of our favorite Hollywood couples, right? And are you ready? They were only married for two years, but they were together for seven. And the answer is? You got it, awesome. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Okay, all right, guys. Um, this next one is not one of my favorite movies. It kind of gives me a small little creep factor that somebody could gain 24 pounds in just a month. And the answer is supersize me, yep. I'm hoping that some of you have had the opportunity to see that movie because it will make us uh, reach deep down inside and want to eat all those carrots and lettuce out of our garden. Okay, this one might be a little bit trickier. This is based off of a children's book. And this particular author also wrote Charlotte's Web. Any hints, anyone? Yep, you guys got it, awesome, Stuart Little. Okay, all right, we only have a few more left minutes left of our icebreaker. Okay, remember I told you that I actually uh, borrowed some of these slides in this icebreaker, and I think this is a hysterical one. So try to guess what movie this could be. You got it, Groundhog Day. But here's the best part, this is a bonus question. What day is really Groundhog Day? Because it's not February 4th. Anyone? You're right, you're right, you're right, right. It's February 2nd, so I think this is fun. Um, okay, last, last one. You guys are doing great. Okay, what could this be? I will give you a couple hints. It was filmed in the Pacific Northwest. That's right, you guys got it. It was filmed in Washington, Oregon, and California. And oddly enough, no Polynesian, Hawaii, or other um, different types of film sets were done. It was just right here on our local coast. Okay, last thing I wanna say before I jump off is thanks for joining our icebreaker. I hope you had a lot of fun with us. Um, I do want you guys to go out and think about movies, think about um, how you can be staying home, being COVID safe, and maybe you can even take time to see Brave Blue World, right? This is our WEF sponsored movie. It's a documentary, a documentary, ah! excuse me, about the water crisis. And for those of you who don't know, just last month in October, it was released on Netflix. So reach out there and um, spend some time being safe in COVID and go see some movies. Okay, thank you guys so much. I look forward to seeing you face-to-face -face in person. And thanks, Laura. We'll take about, we have a little bit more than a ten, five minute break. So our next session will start at 925. So do what you need to do and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes.